good afternoon and welcome um, to this session entitled A Flood of Youth, Should We Keep Fight to Keep Them on the Farm? Um, our speaker this afternoon is Ray Brown, who's the Mayor of the Western Downs Regional Council. Um, uh, and we believe he has to fight to maintain the populations of the townships in the country with a flood of young people leaving the region. It begs the question, should we fight to keep them on the farm or is there a more valuable lesson to be learnt uh, in leaving? Ray Brown's been the Mayor of the Western Downs Regional Council for the past three years and he told me a moment ago that he's been tied up with local government for 22 years, which seems to me amazing given what I take to be his age. Um, his, his shire covers a region, or his regional council, covers an area of 38,000 square kilometres and represents 23 towns and 99 communities. Um, Ray and his family live on their family grain and cattle property, but I suspect he doesn't actually get back there very much, um, which will probably annoy the bejesus out of his family, but that's none of my business. Um, and he has great ties in the, in the rural sector, having connections to the mining sector through the development of the Mooney oil fields on one of his properties. Um, he has, due to a fascination with sport and agriculture, travelled the world, but his passion is the region's communities and where they're heading in the future. And these questions are important for us all because, as someone pointed out this morning, if we don't eat, well, the consequence is pretty obvious. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ray Brown and hear what he has to say. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, yes, it's about a three-and-a-half-hour trip to um, get to Brisbane. I uh, also should add that across our region, I, I do roughly nearly 100,000 kilometres a year in travelling, uh, just to keep uh, my communities up to date with what's occurring. What I thought I'd do is I, I'll give a quick brief slide uh, of uh, what's occurring across the mainly the Surratt Basin. So it gives you just an overall picture and then I'll, I'll delve into some of the issues. The, uh, as you can see, the Surratt Basin there extends from the central Queensland around that uh, Taroom area. Uh, right through down and through to Warwick, but obviously about 85% of the coal mass is in the Western Downs area. Right. The, um, some of our biggest issues, of course, is the resource sector with the mining of uh, coal seam gas, open cut coal mine uh, mines, uh, underground coal gasification, the UCG projects. Uh, also issues with uh, wind farms and solar powered stations. So some major issues we've got there. Um, I'll delve into a few of these uh, briefly afterwards. Thermal coal and coal seam gas, you've probably had some updates throughout the day, have a huge impact across our region. It doesn't matter which foot you put where, in 38,000 square kilometres, there is coal under it. Well aware thermal coal for coal-fired power stations at present. Um, I have six power stations. One of these is coal-fired. Uh, the rest is coal seam gas. Existing coal mines across the basin and the proposed coal mines that I have approval ready for uh, development application approvals and uh, ready for implementation. This is probably the scariest of all. These are the coal deposits that have already gone through the process of approval. Coal seam gas. Obviously a lot of discussions in relation to coal seam gas, good, bad or ugly. Uh, obviously the world thinks it's one of the greatest um, re carbon reducers of power in the world. Uh, obviously nuclear will have some say in that, renewable energies also, but uh, at the moment, flavour of the month, coal seam gas, so you can see the impact that we've got ahead of us. Existing gas wells in the Western Downs and the Surratt Basin. Roughly about 1,200 wells are already in production. Proposal anywhere from 34,000 to 40,000, depending whether they allow the fracking process. They don't allow the fracking, pro well sorry, if they exclude the fracking process, 
at another 25% because they want the gas. Existing power stations, as you can see, we have a total of 19 in the development stages right now and that stems from coal seam gas, uh, two solar projects, one wind farm and uh, the coal mine itself at uh, Kogan which is already producing coal and the proposal for an additional one at Wondolan. And they're the proposed ones that already had development application approvals. You have to understand, uh, hopefully I'll, it'll come up here in a minute, the, uh, the PowerLink grid, we're on the national grid that feeds right through to New South Wales into Victoria and also north into the Calide. So anything next to that big power line and national grid, obviously it's uh, a lot cheaper for these companies to uh, do their processing plants uh, and any other development next to it. The, the slide at the moment here is proje proposed projects that are ahead. These are all gas to liquid or other forms of projects to value add to the existing resources that we have. A lot of people forget about things like the big transmission lines. They have a massive impact, particularly if they have a 400 metre easement where they go across. Some of these projects and EIS approvals are in excess of a billion dollars each. Enormous amount of jobs. But actually they can actually go through state uh, forest leases and through particularly lands in areas where timber and corridors have been um, kept for animal corridors or wildlife corridors, for wind protection, for frost protection for crops. And actually some of this is actually native vegetation land. And they're allowed approval for it as long as they replace it somewhere else in the network. But sometimes it's five to one. For every hectare they knock down they have to multiply it by five. Certainly significant drivers on top of that. To get this coal to port, massive rail lines have to be built. Once again, another two kilometre easement. Pipelines for the coal seam gas, both dirty water and clean water, has to be utilised. The wash plants for the coal-fired power stations, they have to obtain water, whether it's from coal seam gas water or the proposed development of the Nathan Dam on the Dawson River, where they pump the water back over the Great Divide. So you actually lifting water from one catchment into another. Major companies. Of about roughly 81 projects that we have going in the, at the moment, about 37 companies we are dealing with. Some of the key opportunities. With all this development comes enormous opportunities. And I'll speak later on in relation to issues, particularly jobs because it is the four-letter word, but is it really the flavour that we're chasing? <coughs> Some of the benefits. Western Downs Regional Council area live in an area that's 1.7% unemployment rate. If you can't get a job in the Western Downs at the moment, either you're totally unemployable or you're a blue heeler dog. <laughs> I'm fair dinkum. It's, uh, this is the issue at the moment. I look after uh, a regional council area, I have 750 staff. I have 50 vacancies at the moment. Where we employ, and I'll start with one, an admin assistant at Miles, uh, where she was on about $34,000, $36,000 a year, first year out of school, no qualifications for a certificate. She's now driving vehicles for one of the gas companies, earning $87,000 a year. And all she has, to her credit, is a car licence. I lose the head director of my town planning unit at $147,000 a year. He's gone. I just recently informed last week that I lost one of my um, senior girls in our uh, sports and recreation area who have filled out all the forms for grant applications for our communities. A wonderful person to have. She's gone to the gas company. So we are losing key staff. It is not just earth-moving people with you know, greater licences and, and uh, permits to drive forklifts and anything like that. It is across the whole board we are losing staff. 
Also, what's happening is in our agricultural sectors, anyone that can operate any machinery whatsoever can go and get a job in the mines. So our agricultural industry starts to suffer. Great bonus is that actually people who were struggling for an income and still living on a farm can actually go and get a job and subsidise it. And that's probably one of the key benefits that can come out of the resource sector. I'll, br I'll discuss lately in relation to housing in a minute. Issues emerging. Two big key issues that our council has been fighting from day one. Protection of prime agricultural land so we can feed the world in the future. Also the protection of the Great Artesian Basin. There is only one of these basins and is one of our greatest resources. People might think the Western Downs has an enormous amount of resources from mining, agriculture, but our greatest resource is our people. And we mustn't forget that and that's for the future also. Other, other issues that come from this is also the disposal of salt that will come up with the brine water that comes with coal seam gas. I'll talk about ideas in the future later, but one of them will be actually to value add that salt. Presently, we import a million tonnes a year of salt into this country in the form of caustic soda or soda ash, where we mix with ores like bauxite to make aluminium. The only reason we do it is because we can buy it cheaper from a third world country. Let's make these boys and girls who own these companies and run them be accountable. Let's actually value add that salt and use it ourselves. Do not leave it on our landscape that we can pollute the Murray-Darling catchment. Striking the balance, here comes the big issues. It's lovely to have all this jobs and wealth and that that comes into your region because we've had this huge drift of our youth and our other resources, our farmers and that from our region, they have left the industry. Here is an opportunity, the jobs can come to them. We have to do it much smarter though. Some of the issues that we should look at, particularly with landholder engagement, and it doesn't matter what industry it is, you should take the journey with the landholder from day one. Companies should realise and respect that you don't go and knock on the door and say, we're here to mine. Have a joint partnership. My family have been involved with the mining sector for nearly 50 years. We still farm around oil wells. They've been part of our community and we've been part of their community from day one. It is a joint effort. It can be done, but it needs work from both sides. In relation to the coal seam gas industry, I've already proposed this to the ministers and the Premier, that from the company should actually look at engaging the landholder, employ them, train them, not fully trained as an employee, but actually use them as for the tick and flick list. The biggest impact that's on landholders at the moment is the number of vehicles and people that they have no idea transversing their land. The sum of the issues here is if you engage the farmer and you employ them, you gave them a tick and flick list, they're not allowed to touch the machinery. You train them how to use a gas detector. You train them what environmental issues they should look at. Who will be your best number one environmental judge? It's not the government and it's not the company. It's the landholder, the farmer. He's the environmentalist. He knows if something's polluting his land, he's going to report it straight away. You've ticked off number one, protection of the land. All of a sudden, that landholder, he's the only vehicle that's out there. There's no more of these white vehicles going backwards and forwards. You have no idea. The lights at night should only belong to him. Gives him his independence back. Every three months, yes, the company should, they should make sure they're audited to make sure the landholders are doing the right thing too. If the landholder doesn't wish to do it, one, he gets an off-farm income if he does do it. If he doesn't, engage your next-door neighbour. Because I can tell you now, a landholder will, will um, respect and... Uh, acknowledge more his next door neighbour than he will the government or the company. If that person doesn't wish to do it either, engage a local land care group. So there's some standards that can be used across the board. But there's many of these issues, particularly that landholder, it stops pest and weed management issues where you're not having vehicles going from property to property transmitting weeds. 
It's cut slots of this back. For the company's win side of it, one, less employees because they're going to struggle to get employees. Two, they don't have to worry about housing. They actually live on the farm. Three, they've got security. They live on the farm. They're watching what's out there. There needs to be a better engagement with the landholders. Okay, our young farmers, which is probably the main to topic we need to discuss. From my own personal experience, I can tell you now, I have a son who's 21, he's at the university in uh, Queensland, at UQ here. He's studying engineering and commerce. Now, my brother, his two children, neither of them are coming home to the farm, and nor will mine. My father's in the audience here today, and he's well aware that everything he has strived for, what is the future? He had a virgin block of scrub that he started with. Now we are a highly productive farming community. Where is our future? And my response to my son in his final year or last two years of school, and I sat with him and I asked him, do you want to come home and assist on the farm? He just said, why, Dad? The last 10 years, at this stage, all I've seen is drought. So his living memory at 16 years of age is 10 years of drought. He said, you leave in the morning, I don't see you. You come home late at night, I don't see you. Any time I do get to see you doing paperwork to catch up on the report on what you've just done. Is that a good life? This kid said, look, the value of your property is give it to me and I'll put it on the share market. Just think about it. An agricultural property worth a million dollars, the best return you can get on that capital is probably 2.5% on a farm. Is that any way that we can encourage our youth to go back? No way in the world. 20, 30 years ago, there were schemes by the federal government to try and encourage young people under the age of 35 to go back on the land. Other countries across the world do this. They lend up to a million dollars at 2%. But you must be under 35. We need some federal assistance to get the youth back there. Because I'm sorry, the Y generation and anything else since the Y generation are only interested in one thing, and that's money. The word lifestyle is part of it, but nowhere near as respected as the baby boomers. And that's what we're about to lose. The average age of a farmer in, in my area is 57 years of age. It'll be 58 next year and 59 the year after, unless we do something about it. How do we encourage them? One, we have to make sure it's economical for them, extremely important. They want to know if there is an income at the end of it. To see a crop grow from when you plant the seed right through to harvest, and I can tell you all about it, probably one of our best wheat crops that we've ever grown last year, we didn't get to harvest. It rained and it rained and it rained. A lot of areas flooded. Were they insured? No such thing as insurance and crops like that. The loss to Western Downs Regional Council area alone in the agricultural sector from that floods in December and January was $400 million. We thought, well, that's a massive impact to agriculture. The loss to the mining sector, $500 million. They completely shut down for three months. And they did. Now, Mother Nature threw everything they could at us. I had eight towns flooded, 214 homes totally inundated. I have six families still not back in their homes, probably won't go back. The enormous loss and heartbreak, and to actually witness, be able to fly in, I think I spent 30 days from away from home, to fly in on these Black Hawks to properties and find out the family spent the night on the roof with their kids and the kids are crying, 15 years of age, are crying more than the parents. Because everything they've seen their parents develop and improve on that farm just got ripped apart. How do you encourage that 15-year-old boy back to the farm? That memory will be with him for life. So we have to help that way. Enormous help. Look, the mining sector should be congratulated too. They downed tools for three months 
and took the biggest, you probably had Drew Hutton and Cruz in here today, um, at Condamine, where 42 out of 60 homes were totally destroyed uh, with, with flood inundation. They're all back and running now. We had people who were so anti coal seam gas, on each side of them were pushing mud mops, one from Origin and one from Queensland Gas. It really brought the best out of human nature. They're back fighting again now, that's fine. <laughs> but, you know, you can see the issue. The, the spirit is there. Our biggest trouble now is to try and encourage an agricultural industry to get back on its feet. You don't grow a crop overnight. You don't fatten cattle overnight. To see the enormous losses there, and this is what our farming community has to put up with. If it's not drought, then it's flood. Explain that to someone that's sitting in a job getting $100,000 a year. They haven't got that risk. Are humans and people under the age of 40 prepared to take that risk? There lies the issue. We've probably got a banking commission that are not prepared to take that risk either. So what happens is farmers are getting bigger. They're buying their neighbours out. Less people, less schools, less services in their rural areas. How do we stem that flow? A few things about protection. There is no doubt a lot of our area has prime, absolutely magnificent agricultural land and we are hell-bent on protecting it. Does that mean that the mining companies should go on our marginal land? Look, we're humans. We love the lights. We love the aircons. We all have a carbon footprint. What can we bear? Extremely important to acknowledge impact. All land is valuable. I don't care if it's a mangrove swamp. Have a look at Sanctuary Cove. That certainly has value. Is it more valuable as houses on it or is it more valuable as a mangrove swamp? Then you start to stand back, what is lifestyle? I have a lot of rural subdivision areas in the tar, tar area over 4,000 subdivisions in there. They've bought it as lifestyle blocks, very cheap land, very quiet. That is what they called a lifestyle. There's no jobs though. There's no power and no water. What's our duty as a government, local government? We've got to assist our communities. The more we try and assist, the more um, red tape and more uh, protesting we get. That's the type of lifestyle they want. You go down two house blocks and then they say, listen, Mayor Brown, it's the first time my family's ever had a job. They're working with the gas industry. We are now going to build a house. Is that quality of life and lifestyle? It is too, but you're only 400 metres apart. So there's two different types of lifestyle that they want. You go to our business and corporate and commercial sectors in our towns, all they want is backsides coming through the door. That's their type of lifestyle. Houses, prices of houses in miles. 2002, a bloke bought a house for $80,000. He sold it the other day for $472,000 and he never even gave it the decency of a coat of paint. Who's smiling? He is, but guess what? Rentals have gone through the roof. What's happened to my community? Affordable housing, social housing, community housing. Where do I put people? We've never had a soup kitchen in our region. I have a soup kitchen in Dolby. Our parks and gardens officers are picking up people throughout the week, sleeping underneath bridges. Is that the type of lifestyle that we really want? Not in rural and regional Australia. No one hears of that. Guess what? It's occurring. Rental house at one dollar. Thousand dollars a week. Right? You look, seven years ago the Tarum Shire sold vacant land and got five thousand dollars for a block. That same block is registered on the market right now. All he's done is mowed it three times a year for a hundred and fifty thousand. There's a lot of greed out there. For what purpose? Is it good? It really does affect your community. The number of jobs that come in the area. Dolby's gone from 12,000 people to 14,000 people in 18 months. Pretty good growth rate. 
What infrastructure? What dollars from state and federal government going back in the region? Beautiful royalty checks going to the state. Wonderful taxes, 46 and a half cents on the dollar, straight to the federal government. And they won't even acknowledge things like the Warrego Highway or the Second Range Crossing. It is a major artery to our whole western region, not just for mining and not just for agriculture. We've got communities that need to get to Brisbane, that's our only access. So we've got some major issues there in, in, in uh, that sort of infrastructure thing. We, we talk about some of the rural issues. You can see how these pressures start to build up on rural families. And I can tell you one, which is the rural suicide rate. And it's not just youth. It's in the ageing male population, I can tell you. It's got the stage now that a lot of the farmers, because they're 57 plus, if their kids are not going to come home, what are they going to do with their farm? Or if the kids do come home, they are struggling for income. And to hear stories of notes being written to, to parents where the son or, or daughter's committed suicide, and these are particularly in New South Wales, to say, now you can retire, Dad. If that doesn't put a shiver up your spine, we need to change things rapidly. The succession planning, it must be looked at, but there's got to be an incentive for the, uh, the families so that they can actually walk straight into a retirement without that huge financial gain. All farms and farmers put their money back into the farm. They keep improving it. There's no big nest egg and bucket of gold somewhere. They keep putting it back in their farm. They only ever see the money when they sell the farm. And this is what's occurring. In Wondowan's case, uh, with the Extrata mine, 38 properties. They have purchased 35. Guess what happens to the school numbers? Guess what happens to the shops? Guess what happens to everything else? It's coming, it's coming. The big mine is going to be boom. But in the meantime, we've just had a town starting to collapse because there's no support there. The company should be made and I briefly spoke about this earlier with the coordinator generals, when they approve an EIS approval and a, a social impact management plan, they've got to go from day one, infrastructure in those communities. Has to be from day one. You must address affordable housing, social housing, community housing, all the soft infrastructure before you address the hard infrastructure. It is crucial. And on top of that, this EIS approvals, they're now stating how many homes they should put in the regions, Add one more, how many offices and administration buildings and staff go with it? With new technology, NBN, mobile phones, you can do most of your administration work anywhere in this country. Why should they all be sitting here in George Street or Eagle Street or very close to here? Let's put them out there. We do have a great lifestyle. I've got towns that don't have traffic lights. They don't have to wait two and a half hours to get from Ipswich to Brisbane on a bad day. This is what we've got to offer. You still have that rural atmosphere. Crime? Never heard of it. These are the sort of issues. It's a safe area, but we're getting impacted on. We're looking at 14 to 20,000 additional employees to go in our region in the next five years with all these projects. How do you fit them into communities that are designed on a rural and regional basis? I'm not talking about skilled immigrants. We already have a lot of them there now. People don't realise. Our life has changed. Up to 30% of, uh, of these companies, 30% <coughs> are now employing 30% uh, women. On a Tuesday, at the coffee club in Dolby, you used to see women would go on a Tuesday morning and have a cup of coffee. Now we've got eight or ten blokes pushing prams. They go down and have a cup of coffee. Their wife's actually out working. Life has changed. South Africans, Russians, Burmese, Bangladeshians, you name it. You talk about multicultural, it's wonderful. Did we do it right? Our, our communities are so welcoming, we're too welcoming. Because you've got to have some support networks with it. To find people who come from Mongolia, can't speak a word of English, and their husbands are working 
with uh, one of the coal mines, they actually would lock the door in the morning, leave their wife and kid inside, and open it when they come home. Because there's no interpreter. They had no idea. We've got to put the support measures in place. If we're going to bring people into our region, you need to support them. Okay. Um, how am I going? Are you going to ding me in a minute? Okay, I've got to give you a th few more. Great Artesian Basin, I won't harp on it, but it's probably one of our key issues. Some of the ideas, we talk about a festival of ideas. What if we offered the four big companies get them to put $100 million each into a bucket, right? And we go and cap all the flowing bores in Western Queensland, every one of them. Guess what? They'd save twice as, much, twice as much water as what they're going to suck out of the ground. Is that part of the solution? No, it's not. We've got other issues. Contamination of the underground water aquifer. That's one of the greatest assets this country's got. You talk about the Great Artesian Basin, you link it with the Great Barrier Reef. We cannot survive if that water is depleted. Make sure the science is right. And we've been harping on it from day one. Rules, regulations, but make sure the compliance measures are in place. Both state and federal government are quite keen to take the resource money. Let's make sure they're complied with. Very important. My region alone in Western Downs will have 16,000 stock and domestic boars that feed our stock. Don't want it contaminated. On the other side, if we make the regulations for the mining sector right, and they have to prove there's no interlinkages or leakages, should we be doing that to the agricultural industry too? A lot of these boars were sunk after the Second World War. They weren't sealed off well either. Careful what we wish for. Let's do it right. We've got to protect it. But let's start a program also with our agricultural sector to fix their issues too. Our future? Certainly the opportunity for jobs. But it's a sustainable future. It's what we're looking for. How do we draw the balance of agriculture and mining? When you're sitting on this sort of wealth, it makes it extremely hard to make sure our grandchildren and children can actually feed the world for the next 500 years. How we do it? We can start with some of the social and impact plans. Well aware of that. It all comes down to good science and good data. And is it correct? Will we live long enough to see the damage that's been caused? Or will be caused? I remember 20 years ago we were having the same argument about our farming families destroying land, taking the water out of the Murray-Darling Basin. So we were pointing the finger at the farming and agricultural sector also, particularly the cotton industry in those days. Things have changed. Challenges? Certainly the social challenges are massive ahead of us. How can we actually encourage a young person, male or female, to come back on our agricultural lands when you have this huge juggernaut called the energy sector sitting out there paying big wages. How do we compete? As a mayor of a local authority with 750 staff, I can't now. All I can choose and, and offer to them is an employer of choice. Things have changed. I've got elect electricians and that who they'd send two senior staff out to a mine. They'd come back and want double the pay rise they just got offered a job when they got out there. So they try not to send them out anymore because they keep losing staff. <laughs> that's great. Okay, that, that's fine. But, I mean, you've got to be smarter. This electrician actually, he turned around and employed a gardener. An electrician, he went and employed a gardener. Guess what he did? He sent it around to each one of those fellows' homes to do their gardens <coughs> so they could have their weekends off with their family. He then turned around and employed a housemaid to do exactly the same for each one of his staff so that the spouse could have extra time with their kids. Smarter way of doing things. That becomes employer of choice. So some of these incentives we must look at. There's the big one. 
That's what they love. It's that word with the B behind it. Uh, I think the deal of Queensland Gas was $750 million a year out of Western Downs will go to the state government. One company out of 81 projects. One company. Extrata's mine will put $1.3 billion a year into state government revenue. Doesn't matter what political persuasion you are, who's going to pull from that? There's the issue. Dollars talk. As I mentioned with the EIS approvals, people like the Coordinator General have got to think a little bit better about how they do this because they're not just approving an energy sector, they're actually improving an impact it could have on our agricultural sector. They must keep all in mind. We talk about ob objectives and protests. I don't have a problem at all with protesting. As long as it's law-abiding, not a problem. People should be allowed to voice it. It's lucky we live in a country where we can do this. My biggest objectives are in relation to renewable projects. One's a wind farm. 200 objectives. Objecting about a wind farm. Renewable energy, it's green, it's, it's lovely, it's warm, fuzzy. Breath of fresh air, it's all good. No, it's not. Our agricultural sector is up in arms because there is an impact. So it just goes to show that the agricultural sector is not just against coal mining. It's against impact. They are looking at the bigger picture. And this is what we want. We want the science behind approvals. And that's all we plead with the government. As I mentioned before, everything humans do, we have a carbon footprint. And we can't get away from it. But we must minimise it. You talk about our mining sector. I go to the schools and the high schools throughout my region and I ask the kids in their senior years, what are they doing? They've all gone away, get tertiary qualifications and then they're coming back to the mining sector. Hasn't things changed? What, what happened before was, yes, they'd all go away to their uh, tertiary education. None of them came back. They all come across this eastern seaboard. And that was it. They couldn't get over that big hill called the Great Divide again. Our biggest trouble now is how do we get that link to get their education and actually get them back into the agricultural sector. We need to feed the world. We're not making any more land, so we've got to be very smart how we do this. We've got to use the energy sector as a tool where actually it can help promote our regions, but not at all costs. Yes, there is an impact. Acknowledge it and work with it. The big thing is to make sure we have a future out there, and that includes our youth. Thank you. Thanks, Levay. Um, I've been doing this all day, so I'm going to make the same joke again, and I apologise if anyone's heard it before. But this is Queensland, and you're being filmed. So if you want to ask a question, would you mind waiting till a nice person delivers the microphone to you? Um, I also need to warn you that we probably only have about 10 minutes for questions because for various reasons we need to wrap up slightly earlier than planned. So are there any questions? Up, up the back, I think. If you're sitting under those bright lights up the back and I don't acknowledge you, scream because I probably can't see you. Um, Ray, you talked a lot about... Um I guess the, the salaries and the incomes on offer in the mining sector being a big lure for, um, I, I guess, the, the youthful generation to move away from the agricultural sector. Do you think there's something that could be looked at there that perhaps the mining sector is paying overinflated wages, that they need to be incentives for people to work out in these areas, but perhaps the balance is not right? Is there something that we maybe should be looking at there? I, um, I agree. Um, Michael Roach from the Queensland Resource Council, um, I took him to task at the ministerial meeting last week and um, I said, it's your fault that we're in this situation. You're paying all your members far too much. If they halved it, a lot of this would uh, assist. He said, you try and tell that to the union movement. Um, there's the problem. These companies have an enormous amount of money enormous amount of money. I, I know damn well that one of these companies has got 300 million sitting in a community fund for us. 
you know, I, I, I collect 20, $27 million a year in rates out of my whole region. Here they've got 300 million in the community fund. How, how can I compete with that? I mean, um, look, the other side of it though is the agricultural sector. They say, well, why don't we pay more in the agricultural sector to keep them? They can't do it. Our farmers and that are still getting the same amount of money they did for their bullocks and cattle that they, they did 25 years ago. They're actually getting less for their wheat than what they did 25 years ago. How, how, how do we do it? I mean, that, that's the issue is if the farming sector could afford it, they'd love to do it. I think there's a positive at the moment. The cotton industry is really lifted for cotton. That's great. They can actually pay staff a bit more. But what's happened is they've stole that staff away from the, the broadacre farming boys. So now they've got no staff. Um, it's a vicious circle. And I mean, dollars do talk. Um, as I mentioned, quality of lifestyle is the key issue here. What can we offer? Ray, you um, mentioned that you have a lot of multiculturalism in your region. Do you see a different approach to families that have that multicultural background? Do you see them going into agriculture at all? Um, no, and I, I think by putting, um, you know, if they want to swap the 800 illegal, oh, sorry, people come on boats for the 4,000 and bring them into our area, the government needs to think very carefully how they put them into rural and regional Australia because you have to associate them in. Yes, we do have issues in our schools. Uh, we've probably got more of the issue of those that have and have not got money is the issue. You know, when a kid comes home and said, oh, look, I can go on the camp, and the kid next to him says, well, that's all right, because your father works in the, the mining sector, they've got the money. That's not a nice attitude to go through life with. The, the multiculturalism, it, it is, it's great, it is great. I mean, we're very welcoming communities. We've got three towns that have got big, wonderful welcoming committees. The companies that tell us when they put new employees on, we actually sit down, get the volunteers to meet with them, have a cup of coffee and explain to them it's okay to see an 18-year-old fellow running through the park with a pair of shorts on and nothing else. It's okay in this country. That's Australian. You try that in another country, you get shot. Right? And vice versa, to walk down our streets wearing a full burqa you will be looked at. They need to accept both sides. We, who live here, need to accept it too. There is a great opportunity, and we are a country of multicultural. Here's a great opportunity. We need the employees. We do. We don't. Where am I going to find 14,000 people? I've only got 32,000 out there now. They've got to come from somewhere. This mining sector is not going to go away. But we can't forget that I already have a massive agricultural sector. $1.4 billion a year farm grade equivalent comes out of Western Downs. That's a massive industry. Biggest trouble is I'm competing with that 180 one up there. That's the problem. So we're going to have to have a lot more of it. We need the soft infrastructure that goes with it. If you're going to put these people into our region, great. Make sure we have the services that can support them. Gentleman at the front here, please. Um, you made it quite clear that without the infrastructure, you can't carry on. And it's obvious that uh, in, in granting a mining um, permit to proceed, they've got one thing to investigate and... Uh, declare that they've found the minerals we now want to proceed. There should be no um, permission to proceed until first that they've got the essential things that the community has to provide if they don't. And because they don't, as you've already pointed out, uh, there used to be the federal government, for example, would just take that um, $30 billion a mining tax on super profits. It's obvious there that the mining industry should be told that some of that will be advanced to make sure that the local council can continue to provide the services they, they need and everybody else needs in that community. 
And I think that that would be one of the ways, and as far as the farmers are concerned, because they're having the impact, they're taking away their, their um, trained people and so it goes on, their workforce, well then they perhaps could provide a standby levy so as that when there is a time of difficulty, it'll come out of that fund and the farmer can repay it out of profit. If he doesn't make a profit, well then it re diminishes that fund and they must increase it to carry on. That way the farming industry is not going to be denuded and you're not going to lose your workforce and th that subsidy that I refer to will come from that fund. So you don't lose your staff, they don't lose their farm staff and the mining company realises they've got to train their staff instead of pinching them. I, um, I, I can't pick a fight with you on this, that's fine. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I, I think it does, I'll go back to the coordinator general's approval. Key issue number one, you put that uh, agreement in place from day one uh, we're fortunate our local government's been extremely proactive in hitting the companies as soon as they come knocking on the door. We go straight into infrastructure agreements. That's fine. I could, I've, got, I've got roads out there at the moment uh, that have been destroyed by expiration. As soon as they go into production, bang, I want that black stuff on top of it called bitumen. Right? I can do that under these infrastructure agreements. Our other issue is a lot of the roads are state-owned or federal-owned roads no such agreement, you know. Uh, you talk about the billions of dollars in, in royalties that are going out and income tax. You want to set up a fund? Let's set up a fund so we can support the agricultural industry by getting our youth back in there. Low-cost loans, we had it years ago. Uh, these banks are all now gone, controlled by four big, big organisations. Um, let's get some of those funds back into the rural areas. It might be a percentage of this. I'm a heavy supporter of the royalties for the regions, solely where the impacts are, but also the buffer zones around them. Those areas that actually don't have mining, but get all the rubbish that goes with it. They got to be looked after too. We're not saying all the royalties should stay out in our regions, uh, but a set a percentage. The Western Australian model's not quite right, and it's not. Last thing I want is $250,000 toilets on beaches. You know, we actually want to know where the impact is. And it's not just infrastructure, because the poor old ratepayers got to fund the depreciation and ongoing maintenance and operations. I don't want that either. Let's set up a scheme that actually they're contributing all the time. So, um, long way to go. They're, um, I wish the state government and federal governments had thought about this before approvals were granted. Yeah, my family sort of comes from your region um, and my dad grew up on a farm but both his children, tertiary educated, brought up in the city, have no, none of the, the love that he has for, for the bush in rural areas. Um, same with his half-siblings. Everybody grew up on the farm. Everybody was educated in town. One still works on the farm and his children, after they finish um, their university study, will not return so that's the end of that and that's what two generations and they're away from the bush um, whereas everybody who are old uh, just talk fondly and wish they were back there but can't live because of um, their age uh, in a remote area. Um, you talked about uh, hope that um, after tertiary education that people were returning but they were choosing to work within the mines. Um, if the mining jobs, with the money wasn't there, do you feel that those people would then choose to go back to the cities to pursue their professions? Or do you think that there might be a chance for um, uh, affinity with living a rural um, and lifestyle to sort of remain? And this is the opportunity to sort of turn that tide around? Look, I, I think um, money talks. They're not going to come home unless they've got the security of a job and dollars. Agriculture at this stage, at this date, doesn't offer that. We need to change. The goalposts have got to change to say, well, right, how do we do that? We've got some wonderful, very smart agricultural uh, farms out there, farmers both male and female, doing some magnificent things, you know, driverless tractors. 
There's some magnificent uh, inputs. We've actually doubled the yield of a lot of our crops in the last 20 years. You can only go so far. A uh, lot of genetically modified cropping is occurring. There's argument both sides for that. Um, look, wonderful technology that you've got. I just don't know how far we can go. You've still got to make it viable farm. And uh, that agricultural sector, I, I don't know, I'm not talking all about subsidies or, or tax uh, relief issues to farms. I think there's, there's got to be a real holistic approach across the whole lot. Th there might be 20 different things we need to look at. But actually we need some visionaries in state and federal government to say actually how are we going to address this? This country was actually brought up on the rural sector. It's not, it's brought up by five capital cities now. We need to change that. Otherwise we will not be feeding ourselves. We have a huge country. We should be proud of it. We've got a wonderful lifestyle. We live in a country where we don't have the turmoil as the rest of the world's got. Uh, but our agricultural sector, it is treated as a peasant society. And we've got to change that attitude. Look, 15, 20 years ago, every kid in our urban area cities had an uncle or an aunt or a grandfather out on the farm we're going to visit on the weekends or the long weekends. That's gone. The kids now think where milk comes from comes out of the fridge and that's it. It just appears there. People don't realise it. So, you know, our agricultural sector has probably let us down too. We haven't been pushing it enough in, in, uh, in our governments to make them a worth, worthy cause. We're 5% of the population is in rural and regional Australia. We don't have any pol political persuasion in votes in state and federal government. That has to change. I might get it very fast. My region might end up with 14, 20,000 employees. They might all vote Labor and I, the safest National Party seat in Queensland will turn Labor overnight. It could happen. But is it the, you know, we're trying to find what's best for our community and keep the damn politics out of it. And that's some of the issue we've got. It's just that huge wealth of royalties that's keeping them wool blind. They just keep looking at it. They must look to the side and see what's happening to our communities. I think I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Um, can I ask you to join me in thanking Ray Brown very much indeed? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.